Uh, welcome everybody to the UCSF Bay Area Breast Cancer Forum. Uh, and uh, we're really excited to have you here and excited about our discussion today, uh, which is to uh, talk about some of the updates presented at the European Society of Medical Oncology meetings. I'm Hope Rugo, a breast medical oncologist at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Laura Hubbard, who is a faculty member in breast oncology, and Dr. Saya Jacob, who's a senior fellow in our breast oncology program. And then, of course, we wouldn't have the forum without Melody Gaulu, who's uh, coordinated and organized the forum as a volunteer for now quite some number of years. So the way our forum works, and we're really happy to welcome you here, is that we welcome your comments and thoughts. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see a Q&A button. Use the Q&A button to put in questions, and we'll keep uh, an eye on them, and uh, we will also answer them live if we can, and otherwise we'll type in the answers. Uh, the chat button, really, only if you're having some trouble hearing or something like that. Otherwise, Q&A for all the questions regarding our uh, comments and presentations. We'd also love to hear from you about what topics you're interested in for the forum in the future, uh, what you like, what you don't like, uh, and anything else you want to tell us about. Um, we will do our next um, our next uh, forum will be focusing on the San Antonio breast cancer meetings, uh, which will be uh, next week starting on Tuesday and they run through Friday. And uh, we have lots of really interesting data that will be presented there. So we look forward to talking to you about that meeting in early January. Uh, we haven't exactly set the date yet, but it probably will be January 10th. Uh, we do these usually on Wednesdays from 6 to 7.30 p.m. So uh, we look forward to talking to you today. Uh, Dr. Hubbard actually is discussing some additional data from this, uh, these trials at our San Antonio breast cancer meetings. But at ESMO, we saw results from two randomized trials that looked at giving immunotherapy uh, to patients with a different disease subset. So immunotherapy now has been shown to improve outcome for patients who have more, um, you know, a little bit more triple negative breast cancer in the early stage setting. So cancer in lymph nodes or uh, large tumors that are triple negative, ERPR HER2 negative. But there was a lot of interest in looking at more aggressive hormone receptor positive cancers because that represents 70% of all breast cancers. And a subset of those cancers aren't slow growing, but are more fast growing, tend to occur more in younger women. So these trials actually looked at hormone receptor positive breast cancer to see whether or not immunotherapy could help those trials. So I'll let Laura talk now about those trials and the interesting data. And uh, we really look forward to your questions and thoughts as we go. And one of the questions that came up is, will you send a link with the archive of these forums following the call? Um, and Melody will answer that because there is a link that's on our website. And also, if you look up the Bay Area Breast Cancer Forum, it, you, know, um, you can find that. If you use the email that's on that was on your screen and is still in the um, in the pictures of people, um, it's uh, Melody's uh, avatar. Um, if you email there, you can get the link as well. Um, so uh, we'll talk more about that. And we appreciate your questions, even if they weren't areas that we were going to discuss, we will talk about them. So the podium is yours, Laura. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, and I have the pleasure of discussing two separate abstracts, which are both um, somewhat similar. So I'll go through them both. But um, as uh, Hope mentioned, they're both looking at the use of immunotherapy um, for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative early stage breast cancer. So potentially a new patient population that could benefit from this class of medications. Um, and briefly by way of background, just to remind people what immunotherapy is, is we have different classes of cancer um, directed medications. So chemotherapies, endocrine therapies, um, and immunotherapies are basically targeting um, the immune system to rev up the body's immune system to help fight cancer. And it's currently pembrolizumab, one immune uh, immunotherapy drug is approved for triple negative early stage in metastatic setting. And as of now, there are no approved immunotherapy indications for ER positive breast cancer. And so both of these two trials that I'll talk about today are looking at immunotherapy in this patient population in combination with chemo. Um, so as I just mentioned, ER positive, HER2 negative breast cancer um, is a 
common subtype of breast cancer, and some of them are slower growing where the patients don't need chemo, they're, you know, really responsive to endocrine therapy, and other patients have a more fast growing type of ER positive cancer that um, do require chemotherapy um, and are almost more triple negative like. And so the idea here is, can we use immunotherapy, which we know works in triple negative breast cancer in this more fast growing type of ER positive cancer? Um, and so the um, goal here is to see if combining immunotherapy with chemotherapy can improve the rate of PCR. And what that means is if we're giving chemo before surgery and adding the immune drug before surgery, can PCR basically means pathologic complete response where there's no cancer left at the time of surgery. And so um, the goal is to try to increase the rates of PCR. And in ER positive cancer, the PCR rates are relatively low actually. So this type of cancer doesn't melt away to chemo like triple negative does. The PCR rates in various studies are only zero to 18%, so pretty low. So can we, by adding immunotherapy, increase the number of patients where the, the cancer is gone at the time of surgery. Um, and so this is um, the study schema. Um, and I'll note actually the last bullet point is um, this looking at Pembro for ER positive cancers was done as part of the iSpy trial, which um, some of you, you know, may know about or even have participated in. Um, and so um, that was a phase two trial and this is now a phase three trial. So taking um, the early endpoints there that looks promising and studying it in a larger phase three trial. And so this trial enrolled over a thousand patients who had locally confirmed um, ER positive HER2 negative grade three cancer. So a more proliferative subtype. Um, they had to have um, at least a two centimeter tumor that was node positive or a larger tumor that was node negative. Um, they had to be treatment naive. They haven't yet received surgery. They haven't yet received any chemo. And patients were randomized to get pembrolizumab, which is one immune drug, in combination with the chemotherapy ACT regimen, um, and then go to surgery, or they would get placebo um, with the ACT regimen. Um, and this was a randomized trial where they were blinded. These patients got placebo versus pembro, so the patient didn't know which one they were getting. Um, and they went to surgery, and then after surgery, um, they would either continue the Pembro for six months with endocrine therapy or the placebo with endocrine therapy. And the endpoints for the trial were um, PCR, so has the cancer shrunk down where there's nothing left, um, and then also event-free survival, which basically means we'll follow these patients out over time and see rates of recurrence. Um, and we don't yet have the EFS data, um, but the, the data I'm going to show you today is looking at the PR, PCR data, which is the earliest data we have for this trial. Um, I went through that. Um, in the two arms, um, the median age of patients was 49 in each group. Um, these patients um, had, you know, many of them had, 63% um, of them had T1 or T2. Some of them had slightly larger tumors. Um, about 90% of them had nodal involvement. Um, and most of them had ER that was greater than 10%. Um, and here's the really interesting data. So um, looking at the primary endpoint of PCR, um, the, the turquoise here is the pembrolizumab group and the, the maroon color is the placebo group. And as you can see, the patients that got pembro had a higher rate of PCR. So 24% of patients had no cancer left um, after the chemo plus pembro versus only 15.6% with the placebo alone, which is a difference of 8.5 percentage points. Um, which is really, really encouraging. Um, and the p-value is statistically significant. Um, so that was a really um, exciting new um, potential to really increase the rate of PCR by adding the pembrolizumab. There's various other definitions of PCR, um, which I won't get into for sake of time, but basically regardless of how you define PCR, um, we saw about that same margin of benefit with the pembro, which is really very cool. Um, and then looking across subgroups, um, you know, this is um, this line here, zero means they're equal. And then if it goes further to the right, it favors pembrolizumab. If it's over here, it favors placebo. And you can see that across all of these subgroups, these lines are for the most part pushed over to the right. Some of them cross the zero for equivalence, but it suggests that regardless of age, um, PDL1 status, et cetera, how, the, how it was dosed, most of these favor um, the pembrolizumab arm. I think the one I'll note. Certainly in node positive patients were further over to the right. 
and node negative patients, there weren't as many node negative, only 65 here, but it does technically cross the zero line there. So I think that's a group of patients where we'll have to see with more data as it comes out if Pembro will be beneficial for that group of patients. Um, but um, really interesting here um, that most of these groups um, did show benefit to Pem with Pembro. Um, for ER positivity, um, most of the patients in the study, um, 601 here, had um, higher than 10%, and those benefited. Some of them had a lower ER percentage, less than 10%, and those patients in particular benefited even more. These patients are more triple negative like, um, so not to so surprising since we know that Pembro works in that group. Um, the question always with any new drug is, you know, what are the side effects and is it worth it? Um, and as we know, with immunotherapy drugs in general, um, as we rev up the body's immune system to help fight cancer, there's also a risk of autoimmune side effects. So rather than fighting the cancer, the immune system can fight itself and cause um, things like rash, diarrhea, um, and then more rarely things like um, a elevated liver tests. Um, I didn't mention before, sorry, thyroid and adrenal insufficiency are also less rare. The more rare things being heart, lung, neurologic problems. Um, and so these bar graphs show the rates of these um, various events um, with the Pembro arm in turquoise and uh, placebo um, in the maroon and alopecia and nausea pretty high in both, mostly driven by the chemo. Uh, but you can see that some of these other more rare things, the autoimmune things were slightly higher in the um, immunotherapy arms. Um, so the liver tests were you know, slightly higher rates there, for example, diarrhea slightly higher. Um, and then I think I don't have a slide here, but also slightly higher rates of endocrine toxicities, um, and et cetera. Um, so really exciting data. This is the first fully accrued phase three trial of high risk early stage ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer. I think, um, like I mentioned, the, the PCR data is very encouraging that there was an increased rate of cancer being gone at the time of surgery. Um, what we really want to know, though, is does that translate into less recurrences? And so what we were eager to see the event-free survival data, and that is a primary endpoint of this trial. It takes longer to get that event-free survival data because we have to wait for recurrences to happen if they do happen. And so we'll probably end up seeing that data in the next few years. Uh, it will take longer, um, but I think, you know, this is, it probably won't be practice changing. We won't, you know, yet use this drug based on the PCR data alone. We'll really want to see that event-free survival data to know if it's um, worth adding the Pembro. Um, but encouragingly, statistically significant increase in PCR rates by 8.5 percentage points. Um, and PDL1, I didn't show this data for sake of time, but PDL1 status didn't matter. So regardless of whether they had this marker or not, these all these patients benefited. Um, depend, no matter how you define PCR, there was benefit. And then the safety profile was consistent with no known profiles of each regimen with no new safety um, uh, signals observed. And so at this time point, like I said before, the EFS results are immature. So we need to wait to see what that data looks like to know. Um, but I think a really interesting um, study and um, something that, you know, when we finally get the PCR data, we'll know for sure whether it will change practice. Um, but exciting data um, at this point with the PCR um, data for now. And then I have a second abstract. Um, which... so just, I'm just going to break oh, yeah, a moment and say, just to help people who might not quite get all of those details that, you know, PCR, of course, is having no invasive cancer at the time of surgery in your breast and node if you got neoadjuvant chemo. And all of these patients got neoadjuvant chemo, the standard of care for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, where you're going to give chemotherapy, which is people who had high risk disease and they use this grade sort of aggressive looking under the microscope in I spy two, which a lot of people know, we actually use a gene expression test to mama print. And we also look at um, subtypes of disease where triple negative cancers look more like basal like cancers that wasn't done. And we hope that that will be done in future studies of, uh, of this trial, looking at the tumor tissue that they collected to try and better understand that. And then the second part, just to be clear about event-free survival. So Laura was talking about the fact that PCR is a really important endpoint. And we know that if a patient has no invasive cancer at the time of surgery, they have a lower risk of having recurrence than a patient who has a lot of cancer left. 
What's interesting with pembrolizumab in triple negative disease is patients who got pembro, even if they had residual disease, they had a better outcome than if they did not get pembro, which is fascinating. Uh, but of course, it's still better to get a PCR. But this trial only is reporting PCR. They are not going to have the uh, outcome data for quite some time, and the drug won't get approved until there's outcome data. So we won't be using this yet um, in terms of our standard of care, but I think it's really important and interesting. And then there was supportive data from a second trial, which I think is really important as well. So just to answer uh, Amy Delson's question, did they stratify PCR by basal-like? The tumors that are ER positive and are basal-like tend to have an ER less than 10%. <clears throat> and that represented a very small number of patients in this trial. Um, so that was really important. Uh, and it turns out that just looking at high-grade tumors was enough to pick tumors that were going to benefit from immunotherapy, which is quite um, impressive. And the other question, which is if there's no evidence of cancer after these neoadjuvant treatments, what's taken out at surgery? And you take out the tumor bed. So you leave a clip in there so you can take out the tumor bed. And of course, one of the questions and uh, presentation actually at um, ESMO was, you know, could there be breast cancers where you didn't need to do surgery? But right now, because we don't see single cells, we only see, you know, really many, a uh, uh, you know, hundred thousand cells or more, um, we do surgery because we can't be a hundred percent sure there's not a single cell remaining or a few cells. And we often do even radiation in patients who've had a pathologic complete response when they have breast conserving surgery. So um, this is all upcoming questions that will take us quite some time. So back to you, Laura. Oh, thank you. Um, great. And then the next trial I wanted to share with you actually is pretty similar. So I think it will um, help reinforce some of these same points. And let me just share that um, on the current slide, perfect. So this trial is also a phase three trial looking at immunotherapy in the same patient, relatively similar patient population, high risk, ER positive, HER2 negative, um, early stage breast cancer. Rather than using pembrolizumab, which is one PD-1 inhibitor, um, this trial looked at the use of nivolumab, which is a different PD-1 inhibitor. Um, and so um, like we went over before, the most common subtype of breast cancer, um, you know, rates of PCR are low. Can we basically improve those um, by adding um, immunotherapy? So same kind of rationale here. And um, this is the study designed for this trial. So um, very similar inclusion criteria in this trial to the other trial. Um, so newly diagnosed ER positive HER2 negative patients. Um, the slight difference here is T1C and T2 could be node negative in this group, whereas the other trial that had to be node positive. So slightly lower, but there weren't actually that many of those patients. Um, the other slight difference is you remember the last trial, they all had to be grade three. So this trial was grade two or three, although actually the majority of patients ended up being grade three. Um, adequate organ function, good performance status. And so these patients that met criteria with these high risk ER positive cancers were again randomized similarly, one to one. Half of them got nivolumab with the ACT chemotherapy and the other half of them got placebo with ACT chemotherapy. So very similar you know, strategy here, went to surgery and then continued the nivolumab or continued um, in the placebo um, with endo endocrine therapy as well um, afterwards. Um, this trial was powered for PCR only. Um, they were, they, there were various issues with the trial, which I won't get into, where they ended up not powering it to look at EFS, event-free survival, like the other trial. Um, so it's not technically powered for that. It was just powered for PCR. Um, but nonetheless, they'll certainly follow these patients out to look at events um, over time there. Um, these are the patients, they've all been treated at this point. Um, about half of them had completed therapy at the time of, of being reported, and some of them were still on study. So just like the last trial, um, this was an early look at this, this data. And um, these are the PCR results for this trial. So in this trial, 13.8% of patients who got the chemotherapy alone, the ACT, achieved a PCR versus 24.5% who had the nivolumab added, um, a difference of 10.5%, um, which was statistically significant. So pretty similar numbers actually to the other trial, right? You'll remember the other trial, the difference was 8.5%, um, but pretty similar numbers and pretty similar margin, which 
um, is reassuring actually that both trials saw a relatively similar benefit and indeed saw a benefit here in terms of PCR um, with the addition of the um, immunotherapy. Um, and um, the PDL1, um, they looked at does PDL1 status matter? Um, I didn't show this data on the last one, um, but um, we look at this marker of PDL1 is basically how the marker of immunotherapy sensitivity. Um, and we know that patients who have higher PDL1 tend to respond better to immunotherapy. Um, so as you can see here, these patients who had PDL1 um, that was greater than or equal to 1% had an even higher rate of PCR and an even bigger difference, 20.2 um, versus 44.3, the 24% difference. Um, versus those that were PDL1 less than one, um, they just still did have benefit here with the nivolumab, um, but only a 3.6% benefit there. Um, so um, interesting to note that. Um, and secondary endpoints. Um, so in addition to looking at PCR, so PC, the definition of PCR, like I mentioned, is no cancer left at all in the breast and the lymph nodes. Um, in addition to just, that's a binary thing, right? Either you have no, nothing left or you do have something left. We also have this categorization called RCB and that actually stratifies if you do have cancer left, is it just a little bit left? Is it a moderate amount left or is it a lot left? And so RCB one is just a little bit left, two is more three. And so they also looked at rates of RCB zero is essentially a PCR. RCB one is just a little bit left. And so uh, when they combined these two RCB0 and RCB1, um, they saw 21% rate in the chemo only group versus a 30.7, a difference of 9.1%. Um, so also reassuring as there as well. And similarly, looking at the P by PDL1 status, a much more dramatic difference in the PDL1 positive patients. Um, they actually technically didn't see a difference here in the PDL1 negative patients when they combined RCB0 and 1. Sorry, I don't know why these slides say draft finalized. You can ignore that. This is the final presentation there. But um, in terms of safety data here, um, like I mentioned, the rates of um, adverse events, some of them are related to chemo. And what we care in particular about is the rates of autoimmune side effects. Um, and so um, I think there's a separate slide. Um, here we go. Um, so, skin and so uh, having uh, skin disorders related to immunotherapy um, is relatively common. GI toxicities, um, endocrine toxicities, um, and I don't have um, this particular slide showing the specifics, but slightly higher rates of autoimmune effects. And so, to summarize this data, um, there was an improvement in PCR of difference of ten point five percent, also an improvement in RCV. Um, the benefit was more pronounced in patients who had a, a high PDL1 score. And then the safety profile was consistent with known profiles. Um, we know that immunotherapy can cause these autoimmune side effects. Um, and so um, that's something that we'll watch for rates of those um, long term for these patients as well. Um, so I think to summarize both of these trials, we saw a benefit with the addition of these um, PDL, PD1 inhibitors in both of these trials. I think we'll need to see whether this translates into reduction of recurrence risk long-term, and these won't be approved yet until we see that data. So I think we're eager to see that data hopefully in the next couple of years to know if it's something that we'll ultimately use for patients like this. Yeah, I think it's fascinating and also really exciting for us that this all came out of really your work in iSpy where we looked at a more detailed um, and I think probably better assessment of which patients might benefit or not. And so we're looking to the next year and seeing if the further analysis of the tumor samples taken from diagnosis from the patients on these trials might give us more information about the subtypes and who benefited and if there's more data. The trouble is a lot of these large trials that are um, you know, re so-called registration, meaning for approval of drugs, they don't, um, they don't have a lot of tissue collected. So we'll see what we learn because we also don't want to be just giving, um, you know, immunotherapy to everybody and then they get the side effects, which they, we don't want them to need, you know? So that's an important thing. Uh, Laura, a question from one of the people was, what is the reason that only her two negative patients were part of the trial? Is it because there's already an effective treatment for septin for her two positive tumors? Yeah, good question. Um, we do have, yeah, Herceptin and Progetta and other HER2 targeted agents for HER2 positive. 
There are separate trials looking at the use of immunotherapy in HER2 positive patients as well. And so um, that data, some of that will be presented next week at San Antonio actually, but these trials in particular focused on the HER2 negative population. Great, uh, excellent question. And then for those of you who are putting some uh, questions uh, in the chat, we are gonna talk about metastatic breast cancer next. And hormone therapy, we'll talk about after the trials that Sai is gonna talk about now, uh, which is some antibody drug conjugate data, but we then will uh, talk about um, these other questions that are coming up in our uh, Q&A. So stay tuned, we'll be there. All right, Sai is gonna talk a little bit about some antibody drug conjugate data. Okay, let me just share my screen. And all right, so I'm the first abstract I'm going to talk about today is looking at trastuzumab durextecan, TDXD for short. Some of you may already know of this drug, but it goes by the brand name in HER2. Um, basically, as Dr. Rigo mentioned, this is an antibody drug conjugate. What that means is that one side of the drug binds to an antibody and exactly what antibody it binds to is different based on the drug. And the other side has a payload or has a chemotherapy. And so the idea is that by using these antibody drug conjugates, we more in a more targeted manner deliver the chemotherapy to cancer cells. So this particular antibody drug conjugate, TDXD or in HER2, um, binds to the HER2 um, protein and has a payload, again, that's a chemotherapy payload. It's actually already um, FDA approved based on the results of this trial, the Destiny Breast 04 trial. And this abstract actually gives more updated data with long term, longer term follow-up. Um, and so we really need to see how these drugs perform over time to really understand the benefit to patients. Um, so by way of a little bit of background, many of you know that breast cancer has actually expressed a variety of different receptors on their surface. Um, we talked just a little bit about hormone positive breast cancers that express estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, and then a little bit about HER2 positive cancers that have increased levels or amplified levels of the HER2 protein. There is a subset of patients that don't technically meet criteria for HER2 positive. They don't have enough expression, enough amplification to really get that designation, but they do have low lying levels of HER2 expression. So when we stain it, we see that there's some um, expression of the HER2 protein, but just not enough to classify them as HER2 positive. And so the idea behind this trial was in these patients, if we use this antibody drug conjugate directed against the HER2 protein, can we still see a benefit? And so that was the initial Destiny Breast 04 analysis, and it showed an improvement in progression-free survival, meaning the amount of time that patients were on the drug before they needed to change, and then overall survival as well. And so this, um, so the, the primary analysis was at a follow-up of 18.4 months. And so this updated analysis has even more um, follow-up data. The way this trial worked is patients who had HER2 low, meaning low levels of the HER2 expression, but not enough for HER2 positive, and had metastatic breast cancer and that had already undergone either one or two lines of chemotherapy. Um, they were randomized either to receiving TDXD or to getting chemotherapy, kind of standard chemotherapy regimens that would have been available to them otherwise. Um, and so this is the overall survival, both with the initial analysis as well as the updated analysis. Um, Dr. Huppert went a little bit into how to look at these curves, but essentially the higher up you are, the better survival you have. So that blue line there, that's the those are the patients that got TDXD, and you can see it's higher than the gray line. Those are the patients that got chemotherapy, meaning that those patients actually had better survival. You'll see that there's two survival graphs on this slide. On the left side, it's for those patients that are hormone receptor positive. So they have low levels of HER2 expression, and they're also hormone receptor positive, and they had a survival benefit. On the right, it's for all patients. So they could have been hormone receptor positive or negative. And again, you see that there's a survival benefit with using TDXD over the standard chemotherapy agents. Um, this slide shows the overall survival and progressions-free survival of patients with hormone receptor negative patients. So remember, all of these patients still had HER2 low disease, low levels of that HER2 protein, but they may have had estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor either positive or negative. And this is the group that's negative. 
And you can see even in this group that the TDXD patients, that's that blue line, did better and had better overall survival compared to the patients that had standard chemotherapy. The one caveat that I will say about this is there's only 40 patients in this trial that are being analyzed that have hormone receptor negative disease. And in, in other words, that these are 40 patients who have triple negative disease versus when you look at the hormone receptor positive cohort, the numbers are closer to 330. So there's a big difference in the number of patients in these subsets. But even with that difference, we still saw that there was a benefit for the hormone receptor negative patients. Um, there were a variety of different subgroup analyses done to see if there's certain subgroups of patients that benefit more from TDXD compared to chemotherapy. So they looked at patients who had prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. So these would be drugs like ribociclib or Kiskali, abemacyclib or Verzenio um, or palbocyclib or Ibrance. And it looked like regardless, there was still a benefit for TDXD. They also looked at the benefit based on the amount of the HER2 expression. Remember, they all had low levels, but some had very low, some had more moderate, and still there was a benefit. And actually, for most of these subgroups, we saw that there was still a benefit for giving TDXD over other chemotherapy. Um, of course, it's important to think about toxicity just because the treatment is improving survival. If it's causing a lot of toxicity, then that's not necessarily helpful. Um, and so when they looked at TDXD, one of the major side effects that caused treatment discontinuation was ILD or pneumonitis. Another way, in other words, um, inflammation of the lungs related to the drug. And that happened in about 10% of patients. So still not a majority, but definitely a sizable minority and something that we always have to keep an eye out for when patients are on TDXD. Um, and then other side effects that were seen were nausea. That was about 4.6% of patients that had nausea, bad enough that they needed to reduce the dose um, and decrease platelet counts as well. And so with the longer follow-up, we really saw that, that, that the survival benefit with TDXE that we saw initially with the shorter follow-up really stayed true, even when we followed patients out for a longer period of time. Um, and we also saw that the safety profile was similar to what we'd already seen, namely that we need to watch out for lung inflammation or ILD pneumonitis, um, watch out for nausea and watch out for lower blood counts. Um, but overall, I think this is a really incredible and amazing new option for patients who have HER2 low breast cancer, have already undergone one or two lines of chemotherapy, that this can really be a beneficial option. Yeah, that was uh, really helpful and interesting. I think the you know, outcome with 32 months was almost identical to the earlier outcome, although now investigator assess, assess so that's really uh, great. And uh, I think that the, um, you know, that was very encouraging is uh, there is an ongoing study using TDXD, which is also known as inher uh, but we like abbreviations in oncology. Uh, so this drug um, is also being tested in the first line setting. So after you've gotten hormone therapy and targeted agents and need to move on to chemotherapy as a first chemotherapy option compared to standard chemo, and they're including patients who have uh, very little HER2, so so-called ultra low, not zero, but closer to zero than one plus. So that's a whole complicated area. We'll see uh, what happens with those results next year. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think What's just been astonishing for us in oncology is that you could use an antibody targeted to HER2, this is a trastuzumab biosimilar, and attach a toxin to it, and use the right linker, and uh, have this efficacy in tumors that are, by definition, HER2 negative, and they just have a little expression of HER2. They didn't, those patients did not have a response to an earlier antibody drug conjugate called Catsyla, and they don't respond to trastuzumab and pertuzumab either. So uh, Herceptin and Progetta. So it's really quite interesting and uh, really remarkable data. And of course, there's interest in moving um, these drugs to earlier stage treatment as well. Um, although there is an alternative drug that AstraZeneca that is partnering with Daiichi on this drug probably will move forward with uh, and is already moving forward within the earlier stage setting too. Um, we have a second antibody drug conjugate that's approved uh, sasitizumab govitecan, uh, and uh, that one we call SASI, um, also known as Trodelvi. And that one is, regardless of HER2 status, all HER2 negative, again, um, and is approved in patients who've received two lines of systemic therapy for metastatic disease 
The difference is that there's different side effects from these different drugs. So choosing the sequencing of treatment um, is a big challenge for us. And actually, Laura will has done a project on this along with others, and they will be presented at a discussion session at San Antonio uh, talking about what we know now about sequencing different antibody drug conjugates and how we can improve how we understand this effectiveness moving forward. So really an exciting area. So this other antibody drug conjugate was uh, presented, uh, which Saya will talk about, but I just want to answer one question uh, by uh, Kelly uh, Shanahan about the recommendations of frequent CT uh, chest screening will decrease the risk of death, which was 1.1% in Destiny Breast 04 from interstitial lung disease. And I do think that getting CT scans every six to nine weeks in the first year, since 87% of the pneumonitis occurs for the first time in the first year, um, that uh, if we do the CT scans and hold drug, if we see inflammation without symptoms and treat with steroids and discontinue drug, uh, discontinue drugs uh, permanently if patients have symptoms of shortness of breath or cough, with those CT, chest CT findings that we can potentially completely avoid mortality from uh, these, this drug. So I do think the screening is making a really big difference. So tell us a little bit about uh, datapotamab directs to CAN. Will do. Okay, let me share this one. Okay, so this... Um, Abstract is looking at datapotamab durex tcan. So this again is another antibody drug conjugate. Remember, antibody drug conjugates on one side bind an antibody and on the other side deliver a payload or a chemotherapy. This one in particular is different from the one we just talked about in HER2, but similar to the one that Dr. Rugo just mentioned, sasituzumab, in that it binds a similar antibody, the trope 2 antibody, and again delivers a chemotherapy um, agent. And so this drug was used in patients who had metastatic hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative breast cancer. Um, and so this kind of just talks about how these antibody drug conjugates are made, that they have one side again that's directed against the antibody, in this case, the trope 2, and then the other side that has some kind of toxin. In this case, it's a topoisomerase 1 inhibitor, basically a chemotherapy agent. Um, so in this trial, patients, again, who had metastatic hormone receptor positive breast cancer, who had already undergone one to two lines of chemotherapy and also progressed on endocrine therapy, were randomized, either receiving datapotamab, DXD, or getting um, chemotherapy, kind of standard chemotherapy regimens. And so this tells you a little bit about the two different groups. I think the main takeaway here is that between the two groups, patients were overall pretty similar. Age was similar. The numbers were similar, 360 in each group. Um, racial and ethnic breakdowns were similar. Number of patients that got one versus two lines of chemotherapy or got prior CDK4-6 inhibitors were all kind of similar. Same with patients that had gotten prior taxane or anthracycline, which is important when you compare groups to make sure that they are somewhat similar um, in who's being enrolled in the groups. And so this is the progression-free survival. Remember, progression-free survival means the amount of time patients can be on a treatment before they need to switch, typically for progression or sometimes for toxicity. And again, the higher up on the y-axis the line is, the better survival there is. And so you can see here that patients who got the DATO DXD are represented in that purplish um, color compared to, I guess they're both kind of purple, but the darker purple versus the more indigo color. Um, so they had better survival compared to patients getting standard of care chemotherapy. Um, the toxicity from this trial, so I think this is a really important takeaway that the, the grade three toxicities, meaning toxicities that we consider to be severe, were a lot lower in the patients who got the DATO DXD. So it was 75 or 21% compared to 157 or 45% getting standard chemotherapy, which is a really, so really important. Not only does it seem to improve progression-free survival, but it's also better tolerated by most patients. And that's, I think, really, really important. Um, the most common side effects that were seen were low blood counts, especially anemia or low red blood cell counts, and neutropenia or low white blood cell counts. And so patients may have needed 
um, shots, growth factor shots to help increase white blood cells. Some patients also developed dry eyes. And then there were a variety of GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, constipation, stomatitis is another way of saying mouth sores, um, fatigue, and then hair loss was seen. Um, and so overall, there was improved progression-free survival with the use of DATO DXD. Again, this is for patients with stage four metastatic hormone receptor positive cancer who have already undergone endocrine therapy in one to two lines of chemotherapy. And for these patients, DATO DXD may be really beneficial. Um, we have at this point seen a progression-free survival difference, but we really need longer follow-up to determine if there's an overall survival difference. Are patients on DATO DXD actually living longer um, to really make that full assessment? I didn't go through this data, but there was also a higher objective response rate in the patients that got DATO DXD compared to chemotherapy. Basically, what that means is that when we look at the scans, that there are patients who have clearly less disease burden on the scan. So another really promising sign that this is a really helpful antibody drug conjugate. Um, we talked a little bit about the really incredibly, um, the incredible difference in the toxicity that's seen thus far and the decrease in grade three toxicities or severe toxicities with data DXD as compared to standard of care chemotherapy. And that most toxicities that were experienced were actually lower grade toxicities or milder toxicities. Um, and so I think this is an exciting new antibody drug conjugate. The data is still preliminary, but very, very favorable. And I think we'll be interested to see with longer follow-up what we find. Yeah, I think this is uh, really interesting and uh, certainly encouraging. We did actually uh, looked at DATO DXD in uh, our iSpy trial and uh, that was, uh, you know, we we don't I haven't reported that data yet. The arms have closed, and it, one arm was Dado uh, with just itself for four doses, and the other as neoadjuvant therapy. The other was Dado DXD with an immunotherapy drug from AstraZeneca Dervalumab, and uh, for four doses. And then, you know, we base our uh, assessment with MRI and biopsies on response and what happens next. So it will be fascinating to see that data next year come together to understand how those drugs worked. And of course, this drug is being studied in triple negative breast cancer, um, both in metastatic disease and in patients with residual cancer after neoadjuvant therapy. So also is the antibody drug conjugate Trodelvi or sasetizumab govitecan with pembrolizumab, the immunotherapy drug. And then datapotumab will be given before surgery in more doses in another type of uh, study. So these are all very interesting. And of course, you know, the drug we talked about earlier, trastuzumab durextacan is approved for HER2 positive disease, where it is dramatically better than our standard uh, antibody drug conjugate, huge impact. Um, and so that, you know, it's clearly big, big uh, impact there. So, um, and uh, so, uh, I think one of the questions, um, some of the questions here are a little bit difficult. So just to, um, there, uh, Kelly asks, is there data on differences between uh, trope two expression um, and uh, the there that analysis has not yet been presented for uh, uh, data potumab, drexican, and tropion, but I think that we will see data in the very near future about that. Um, because there's additional data being presented at San Antonio and, of course, next year. Um, and then one of the questions is, if the drug is approved, what will you choose after progression on CDK4-6 inhibitor? And I think there is a balance of toxicity that's probably a little bit too much detail to go through here, but I think we're also waiting for the survival data from data potumab, so that will play a role. What do you think, Saya? Yeah, I agree. I think it's it's really good that we're seeing the PFS benefit, but we really need to wait for that overall survival, I think, before choosing it over other things that have a demonstrated overall survival benefit like sesetuzumab or tradelvi. And how about was one of the questions was ER low positive included in this study? Um, I think I'd have to. I did. One plus, anything greater, 1% or greater uh, was included. I don't think there were tons and tons of patients who were low, but we don't even have that data yet. It will come up later. Um, and I think that, you know, looking at this by ER differential, the estrogen receptor, how positive it is will be really interesting to see. But again, this is very new data 
And uh, we'll see more of that as we go forward. Um, and, uh, you know, because DATO DXD works in triple negative disease like sasituzumab or Tridelvi, um, it won't, shouldn't really matter whether the tumor is ER low or not. And then also, you know, that it's really hard to keep biopsying tumors as patients know, I mean, you keep poking needles in patients and um, not getting enough tumor. And so, you know, we don't actually know if the ER is maintained when patients started on study, because even if they had ER positive disease, when they got diagnosed, the ER goes away in some tumors. So that wasn't an analyzed carefully with any of these studies. Um, because of course the efficacy crosses ER. So Laura, a question from the, um, uh, let's see, answer live, got that. A uh, cancer from, uh, a, a question from the Q and A is, is it a good idea to use Zarzio together with Kiskali every month during the rest weeks for years? Zarzio being the uh, growth factor, Belgrastim, some people uh, also use it. That's a biosimilar. It's also called Nupagen. And Kiskali is ribociclib, one of the CDK4-6 inhibitors. Yeah, so um, I don't, we don't generally use Zarzio in this setting. Um, so Kiskali or uh, ribociclib um, is given three weeks on, one week off, so that you're, the during the three weeks on, your white blood cell goes down, and then the off week allows it to recover. And we usually don't use Zarzio. We just allow that time to allow for recovery. If it's still low after the seven days, um, there's a few options. I think one option that I use commonly is add a few extra off days. Um, or the other thing you can do is lower the dose of the ribocyclib um, rather than using Zarzio in the setting. Yeah, and I think that's a really important uh, point because uh, Zar um, ribocyclib in the metastatic setting is given uh, initially at 600 milligrams. But when patients needed to dose reduce, most commonly for neutropenia, sometimes for liver enzyme abnormalities, which can be seen, um, then they got 400 milligrams. They had the same outcome, so the same benefit from ribociclib as if they took 600 milligrams. And that actually led to 400 milligrams being the dosage that was used in the early stage study called the Natalie trial. So we don't use growth factor. The only setting to use a growth factor shot, so-called Zarzio here in this question, is in uh, patients who have fever and low neutrophils, so a serious infection. Otherwise, people don't seem to get serious infections. Uh, we just follow and wait for recovery. And if recovery happens in 10 days or so, we're good. And if it really keeps being really low and below 500 is the neutrophils, then we dose reduce. So, but we don't give Zarzio. And the question was, is it a good idea? Because it's not needed, it's not a worthwhile use of expense in poking you. Um, it doesn't seem to have a downside, except for that there's no upside. So I wouldn't use it. Um, another question that uh, comes up is um, uh, if the ER goes away, is the patient or their tumor triple negative? Saya, is that the case? Yeah, I think we see this often as people get treated with hormone agents that the cancer sort of changes its expression. But I don't necessarily think that we would think of it as triple negative. It still ha has a biology that seems more akin to hormone receptor positive disease, but it may indicate that the tumor is less responsive to more hormone agents and may, we may need to change treatment to more chemotherapy-based agents. Um, the other thing that can happen is sometimes the treatment itself can cause decreased levels of ER um, um, expression. So for example, with fulvestrant or vasodex, oftentimes we see that if we biopsy after giving that, that the tumors don't necessarily express estrogen receptor. That doesn't mean that they're not hormone receptor positive um, cancers. It's just a function of the treatment that we're giving. Yeah, it's a really good answer. And I think that we, for the purposes of these trials, when a patient, if a patient was had ER positive disease and then their biopsy shows ER negative, PR negative, HER2 negative disease, they would be classified as triple negative for the purposes of clinical trials. I think the caveats, in addition to what Saya mentioned, is that if you biopsy bone and decalcify it, you can lose ER. So that can give you a false negative. In other words, you really do have hormone receptor positive disease, but the biopsy says it's ER negative. And we've had people respond to hormone therapy for years who had a bone biopsy showing it was ER negative. So one has to be very cautious in that situation. Um, but we do see loss of ER in patients over the course of years and with more aggressive cancers. 
And then Kelly also points out in our Q&A box that if your neutrophils are low in the morning, like if you do a first uh, blood draw, first thing in the morning, and you're on one of these CDK4-6 inhibitors, and it's your week off, and you're doing your test, we found that people, it's so funny because we only learned this through the CDK4-6 inhibitors, people's neutrophils could be low, but they that's because they all stick to the walls of the blood vessel overnight. And if you run around, we don't know how much running around, it's not very scientific, but if you run around, you know, run upstairs, move around, check your labs a little bit later, it can go up. And sometimes we see people double their neutrophil count just by moving around a little bit and waiting a couple of hours. So um, it's just a lesson not to do the labs very first thing in the morning because um, you're likely to be low even when you might not be. Um, so then that would make people nervous, you know, about that. Another question that uh, is in the uh, Q&A is uh, what is coming up for patients who have ESR1 mutations. And of course, there's a lot of interest in new agents for ESR1 mutations. And we have uh, one drug that's approved, Alicestrant. Do you want to talk a little bit uh, to that, Laura? Sure. Yeah. So um, an ESR1 mutation is a specific mutation in the estrogen receptor that um, makes the tumor um, more susceptible to certain mutations called oral SIRDs. And there's one um, oral SIRD that's currently approved called Elicestrant based on a phase three trial called the Emerald trial that compared this to Polvestrant, which is a shot form of a SIRD. And so these are basically oral forms of the same drug and showed that it was superior. Um, there's a number of different oral SIRDs under investigation right now. And a lot of interest in can we combine these oral SIRDs with other agents as well? So combining them with like a CDK4-6 inhibitor or, you know, other um, not other other agents in general. Um, and so um, hopefully we'll get some of these combinations approved in the future as well. Um, but I think it's a good option. And the question always is, like, when should I test for these ESR1 mutations? It's important to understand ESR1 mutations develop in response to endocrine therapy. So while you're on an AI in your first line, it's not worth checking it at the beginning because you probably won't have it. But as you're on the AI for a longer time and then your cancer grows, that's when you want to check it is at, before you start your second line is check it at that point because it might have developed in the interim. And if it has developed, then you would be eligible for some of these therapies um, and so important to understand that you can kind of repeat this check over time to see if that mutation develops and if it's an option for you. Yeah, I think that's a uh, really nice explanation of this. I think the issue with these drugs is that, you know, when a new drug comes out, there's always a lot of interest in trying it. But uh, the LSSTRAN data suggests that the, you know, responses are better if the cancer is still sensitive to endocrine therapy. So as a millionth line option after lots of chemo, it's really unlikely to work. It's um, going to work more in patients who uh, still have hormone sensitive disease. Um, and usually that one of the things they looked at in the Emerald trial as a surrogate marker of hormone sensitivity was how long a patient had been on a CDK4-6 inhibitor and patients who'd been on for 12 months or longer seemed to gain a really big benefit from taking alicestrin. Uh, versus standard endocrine therapy, uh, which wasn't the same as their other drugs. And it's specifically in that ESR1 muta mutated uh, group, so that where the tumors got ESR1 mutations, uh, where uh, the benefit was seen. Now, the newer endocrine therapies that are being studied, there are some that have been suggested to work better, even regardless of ESR1 mutations. They degrade the estrogen receptor and downregulate it. There are some that prevent the formation of the estrogen receptor through a complicated process. You know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, and the but these drugs seem to be very potent and reasonably well tolerated. You know, some funny little side effects, but we don't know how big they are till we get the big randomized trials because these are all very early. Um, and they're oral, which is great. So I think the big question for us now is, can we combine them well with our other targeted agents and move them forward um, in uh, patients who have uh, you know, tumors with ESR1 mutations without? It's kind of hard to know. I mean, Elisestrin had a hint of activity in those patients who didn't have ESR1 mutations. So I think that um, it's very possible that we're going to have a lot of these drugs in the future that will really uh, give lots of new outcome, but not lots of new options. And then, of course, if that happens, the next interest is seeing if you could replace an aromatase inhibitor, like so you gave a patient an aromatase inhibitor for a higher risk cancer, early stage disease, 
And after there's a trial we have open at UCSF where after two to five years of that aromatase inhibitor, you can be randomized to either switch to the oral CERD, a drug called imlunestrant, um, or stay on your aromatase inhibitor. And I think that that's a very cool trial because you have a 50% chance of getting the new drug. And if you don't get the new drug, you're still getting standard therapy with close follow-up. So to me, that's, I think, a really exciting uh, new approach in patients who've already been on an aromatase inhibitor. We have a bunch of trials open in the uh, metastatic setting and are very excited about seeing how these move forward. Most of them have combinations uh, with various drugs. So that's exciting. Now, what happens if you have an ESR1 mutation and you don't have a lot of drug options? I think obviously the antibody drug conjugates are good options. There are other targeted therapies and earlier stage uh, uh, studies as well that uh, may be options for patients. So uh, let's see, then there's another uh, question, uh, which is interesting. Um, do we think that combination therapies will be better than monotherapy in patients whose cancers start growing on endocrine therapy and a CDK4-6 inhibitor in the metastatic setting? So I don't know, what do you think, um, Laura, about that? Yeah, I'm hopeful that the combinations will be even more you know, effective than the monotherapy. I think we have to wait, of course, and see the data. Um, like Hope was mentioning, those patients that had a long duration of response, greater than 12 months on first line, um, tended to do better. But those who had shorter progressed more quickly on the alicesterone. So in particular, those patients that don't have as long of a time on first line, I think combination will be a key to try to maximize um, benefit um, in second lines and beyond. Um, so I am excited to see some of that data coming out soon. Yeah, I think that um, that's a really um, good point. And I do think that we're excited about combinations. In fact, one combination that we studied was a drug called capivaceratib, which is called an AKT inhibitor. And it inhibits part of a pathway that's the most commonly altered pathway in breast cancer called the PI3 kinase pathway. Um, and that drug combined with fulvestrin or Fazlodex improved progression-free survival um, and was recently approved. Uh, Saya, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and the side effects of capivaceratib? Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, it's targeting a mutation that's found in many breast cancers. And this can be tested sometimes by doing ctDNA testing in the blood to look for the AKT mutation or from tumor biopsies. So of course, as we mentioned, that's a lot harder to do repeatedly. And so for patients who have, who do have mutations in the AKT and have already received CDK4-6 inhibitors and progressed on that, this drug, Capivacertib, has just recently been approved and has been shown to be very effective. Um, as far as the side effects, the most common things seen were rash and diarrhea um, in the Capivacertib group. Um, in, and this was in a trial where it was combined with fulvestrant. So potentially there's some interaction there, but predominantly rash and diarrhea were what was seen. Yeah, I think that uh, rash was seen about 38% and diarrhea, um, serious diarrhea in about 10%. I mean, it's kind of interesting. I mean, TDXD, we heard about, you know, 78% of people get nausea, although only a small percentage get bad nausea and we can control it pretty well. We don't see a lot of nausea with these drugs, but we see other toxicities. And when you affect the PI3 kinase pathway, you do get rash and diarrhea. But uh, thankfully, you don't get the sugar problem so much that we see with the other drug that's approved here called Alpelisib or Picre, where the sugar problems were really huge challenge to deal with. So, And rash seems to be more common and more difficult to manage. Capi, Capivacertib or TruCap is uh, given for four days on, three days off. So it probably helps with the management of the side effects. And we're studying actually capivacertib in combination with a CDK4-6 inhibitor and endocrine therapy, fulvestrant, um, in patients whose cancers recur early um, on their early stage treatment to see whether, because in animals, that triplet worked really, really well. So we're trying to see um, if that happens. You know, it seems like it's an effective combination. Is it better than giving two drugs? That's what we need to answer the question about. Um, and um, so then let's see, uh, we answered those questions. And of course, put your questions in um, if we didn't answer them or anything else. I think what I'll do is just show, somebody asked about the key 67 requirement for the Monarch E trial. And the Monarch E trial was actually updated at um, ESMO, if I can find where what I did with the 
slides here. Um, okay, there it is. And uh, I'll just um, show these quickly because um, I think it's worthwhile just seeing this. I mean, the reason why this is exciting for us is that um, the, uh, you know, we want to be able to reduce the chance of distant recurrence in anybody who has early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer as much as possible. And since the CDK4-6 inhibitors are pretty well tolerated and you could uh, you know, improve survival in metastatic disease, the idea was that maybe if you gave it in early stage high-risk disease, you could also improve outcome. And we've seen some very cool things with this uh, study actually. So let's see if I can get to my button to make it into a full screen. Okay, so um, this uh, was the update here, and we participated in the study, so that's why we're also authors on this. Let's see. Um, and uh, this is the studies, the Monarch E study randomized patients who had no depositive high-risk early-stage breast cancer, and they had to have a high risk based on having one to three positive nodes and grade three disease or a tumor greater than five centimeters or a key 67, a marker of cell turnover that was 20% or greater. And then if you just had four or more positive nodes, you were eligible. Patients all got their standard hormone therapy, and then they were randomized, 5,600 women, to receive a bemaciclib or not. Bemaciclib is also known as Verzenio, and it's taken twice a day continuously, so it doesn't get that week off like ribociclib and palbociclib. And uh, they did an analysis. Uh, now, this is their third interim analysis, basically looking to see what happened. You give the abemaciclib for two years, and then you continue the endocrine therapy uh, for as long as the doctor thought the patient should stay on it um, and look to see whether or not patients have recurrence or not. So remember that now patients, the median is five years of follow-up out here. So people have been off treatment for a median of three years with a bemaciclib, although they're still taking the hormone therapy. And then the control group just was on hormone therapy the whole time. So what they saw, which was really fascinating, was that uh, patients, um, here's the abemaciclib period for two years, that if you go out to 60 months, this is now five years, that the curves are still separating more and more. So there's less and less recurrence the farther out you go, which suggests that just that two years is still impacting these recurrences that occur three years later, which is amazing. So from 2.8, 4.86, 7.6%. .6%, so really exciting to see that continuous benefit. This just says that all the different subgroups of patients benefited. Um, and then what's really important, I think, to the patients and to us as oncologists is preventing distant recurrence. And you can see that you're also seeing this continuous improvement in the uh, benefit of adding a bemacyclic to endocrine therapy out to five years, with now the difference being almost 7%. So it does suggest that when you do this treatment for two years, that you're getting this sort of you know long-term effect, which is amazing. Um, and uh, there were, although survival is still early, and this is actually a really good thing for our patients, that survival for early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer, even with recurrence, is improving continuously with our better therapies. Um, so that's great because these curves are still very, very good at five years, even with high risk cancer. But there were actually less numeric deaths, so 234 versus 208. And there were less patients who actually li were living with metastatic disease who got a bemaciclib. So it seems to really have reduced that. This is the green living with uh, metastatic disease. Here's the abemaciclib. Here's the ones who took endocrine therapy alone. And then in terms of the question that was in the chat about key 67, this is a marker of proliferation. And originally the FDA in an abundance of caution, the drug causes diarrhea and it's expensive and you have to take it for two years and it causes fatigue, right? So, and people have largely finished their chemotherapy, surgery, radiation, and now they're taking in addition to endocrine therapy, another agent. So, they said, well, key 67, you know, is a high risk, uh, a prognostic factor. So they can just approve it in the high key 67 group. But then with this longer term follow-up that happened regardless of key 67, they took away that requirement uh, earlier this year, uh, which was late. I mean, we already were not using it in clinic because it didn't make any sense. But here you can see for invasive disease-free survival, so that's any kind of recurrence, distant recurrences, these hazard ratios, which show the relative benefit, are identical regardless of whether you had a low key 67 or a high key 67. So I think that that's really convincing uh, for the fact that 
the uh, drug works regardless of key 67. Now, I will say that the patients who had very high key 67 had a higher risk of recurrence and with endocrine therapy um, had the highest risk of recurrence here. As you can see that 25% had had some distant event by five years. So we definitely wanna improve that outcome. I mean, this is a really big uh, improvement in outcome here. Um, and uh, safety, um, basically there was no new safety events because everybody was off treatment, but dibamaciclib causes diarrhea, some little increase in liver enzymes. Um, if you take it with tamoxifen, it can increase blood clots, and then it can uh, also um, cause low neutrophils, but it's just much less common than ribociclib or palbociclib. Um, so that's great. There was no long-term effects, which was very exciting about this. Um, so I think this was a very exciting ongoing data, and it was the data, the first data at four years that continued to show uh, the uh, this carryover effect that led to the FDA dropping the key 67 uh, requirement. So that was very exciting. Um, so, um, and one of the questions is, why does it still work after two years? Uh, do one of you want to tackle that question? Um, I can say that I'm not sure. <laughs> and I, I don't know that many of us are really that sure. It might be something to do with the latency of any cells that might still be within the body. And somehow the CDK4-6 inhibitors are able to target those cells. But um, Laura, I don't know if you know. Yeah, I think um, referring to the carryover effect that um, Hope was mentioning, the fact that even if you've only been on it for two years, if you are able to kill more of those cells, the benefit is still there beyond those two years. And so you're seeing less recurrences even further out. And so the curves get wider because you've kind of done that work in those first two years and carry over to have that benefit going forward. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that one of the things that's poorly, under, very poorly understood in ER positive disease is this concept of dormancy, that you have cancer cells that are alive, that are destined to grow back and cause recurrences. And we see these late recurrences, you know, 10, 15 years out um, and even further. So this idea is that you're killing those dormant cells early on, even though they're not cycling very much. So um, it, I think that's a really exciting concept. We had seen it with hormone therapy. So if you gave five years of tamoxifen, you still were having a better impact on recurrence at 15 years compared to giving two years of tamoxifen. And this was a study which has, you know, done a very, very long time ago. So really interesting. One of the questions also came up is why not give five years like the hormone therapy? And um, in fact, ribociclib or Kiskali tried to address this in the Natalie trial, where they gave three years of ribociclib. Uh, they just have presented data where uh, only a small percentage of people have finished three years, but have already seen an early improvement that's significant in invasive disease-free survival and distant recurrence. So we'll see an update at San Antonio on that, and we'll continue to see updated data. It's still early, but they gave three years. And, you know, of course, we're not comparing three years to two years, so we're not going to even know what the right number is. And they treated patients who uh, were a little uh, lower um, in uh, terms of risk. So some no negative patients who weren't included in Monarch E. Um, and then of course, there's a related question, which is that why in the patient forums and online groups are oncologists using three years of Verzenio instead of two or Bemaciclib. And that's really just because of the Natalie trial. We have no data to support it. <laughs> so it's kind of a funny thing. Uh, actually that people are doing that. But, you know, you get anxious if somebody has a lot of positive nodes and you, you, know, you really want to improve outcome. It's very hard to stop in that kind of situation where you're feeling particularly concerned about risk. Um, so uh, we have gone through most of our presentations. We had a little update on the neoadjuvant immunotherapy trial called Kino 522, but that's going to be updated further next week. So I figure we'll just talk about it in January when we do San Antonio. There were a lot of really interesting small bits of data uh, talking about um, different endocrine therapies, et cetera, in the metastatic setting, and a very interesting trial from MD Anderson uh, looking at not even doing surgery in very low-risk cancers and following patients over time. Um, we can talk about some of that later too, but I think that that's unlikely to reach prime time at the moment. So I think it's probably early to be uh, really uh, thinking about that as a uh, part of our, um, I think, overall thinking. Uh, there are a bunch of trials looking at antibody drug conjugates, as I mentioned early. So we have a first-line trial 
for a triple negative disease with datapotumab directs to can in a first-line trial for hormone receptor positive disease after endocrine therapy with sasetuzumab, govotecan. Um, and then uh, we have uh, you know, trials that are looking at these drugs in earlier high-risk disease um, as well. But I think in the metastatic setting is where we really uh, are pushing to try and use the drugs earlier and before more resistance develops. There's also a whole host of new drugs. Um, there's a new trope too, similar to Dato, Potomab, and Sasetuzumab. There's a new trope 2 ADC that will be studied um, from uh, a collaboration with Merck and a company in China. Uh, and so those trials are going to be go going in 2024. So we're thinking like, wow, there are so many drugs. Laura Hubbard um, is doing uh, some studies looking at a new HER2 ADC and HER2 low disease after TDXD. And also we're doing a study in HER2 positive disease after uh, TDXD. So there's lots going on with this area of antibody drug conjugates, targeted therapy for hormone disease, ther hormone receptor positive disease, and new hormone therapy. So a lot of exciting things along with, of course, our, um, our uh, iSPY trial, which is looking at a lot of novel agents in that area uh, too. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of interest in that uh, MD Anderson study results. Um, why China? It's because that's where the drug was and Merck wanted to acquire that uh, drug because they wanted to be competing there. Um, if I could pull up, I have to say that uh, slide set from Henry Cure, I would do that. Let's see, Cure Omission Surgery. Let's see, maybe I can pull it up quickly. Um, okay, omission of breast surgery. So let me uh, uh, share this. Maybe we can do this as our last uh, discussion. Hopefully I have the right one up here. Yeah. Okay, so this is a really, uh, actually Henry Cure was at UCSF briefly and then he went back to uh, MD Anderson in, uh, in Houston and uh, that is where um, he is. And um, yeah, then one of the questions that came up is why do so many drugs do DXD as a payload? Because Daiichi uh, got a good technology of making these antibody drug conjugates that seem to really work, a good linker, a good number of toxins per antibody. So then they just use the same toxin. And yes, it would be much better to have different payloads. <laughs> and the trouble has been using different payloads that don't cause terrible toxicity, neuropathy, eye toxicity, et cetera. So this is all uh, complicated. Um, all right, so let's talk about this um, study as uh, was asked by one of the attendees. So um, this was an idea of omission of breast surgery after neoadjuvant systemic therapy for invasive cancer. It's three-year update. Um, and the group is called the Exceptional Responders Study Group, which he, uh, they called it. Um, and uh, the, what they did was they said, okay, and we're doing this as part of iSpy too, is you give neoadjuvant chemo and then you do MRI imaging or mammogram and you do a biopsy and decide whether or not the patient really has any cancer left there or not. And we're using that to try and de-escalate treatment in iSpy. So if you have a biopsy that's negative, after getting half of the treatment, maybe you could stop and go to surgery because if you have a PCR, you do well. So there they're showing that if you did a biopsy and it was negative, the um, correlation with having a true pathologic complete response was very high. So they did a study, multi-center, and they included women who were 40 years or older, and that's really because younger women tend to have multifocal, more aggressive cancers. You could have had a single triple negative tumor or HER2 positive. It had to, could be up to five centimeters. You could have had um, up to four abnormal uh, axillary nodes on ultrasound, a lot of cancer. And then any clinical chosen neoadjuvant systemic therapy, that's NST, and the tumor had to shrink to less than or equal to two centimeters on final breast imaging. They excluded patients who had a prior cancer, um, progression, distant metastases, big tumors, all the same things, not being pregnant. So the idea was to say that they could, uh, whether or not they could get a, a treatment response rate that was good at 12 months and not have uh, local recurrence. Uh, and so they did a feasibility study and that seemed to uh, be okay. So now they're showing the follow-up of uh, the ipsilateral uh, breast um, being free of treatment. I don't know what they were calling their IBTR here, but um, let's see if I can get it to go backwards. 
Um, yeah, I think that they basically are just looking at um, the ipsilateral breast recurrence and how much you have uh, there is their IBTR. So basically, uh, they looked for patients who had residual disease, no no residual disease by biopsy, um, and then they did no breast surgery and followed them for ipsilateral breast uh, tumor recurrence free survival, meaning you didn't have any recurrence in that breast. Um, and then if you had residual disease, either invasive or in situ, then you had standard surgery. Um, so that was, I mean, it's really a very novel approach. They had 58 patients in, uh, 50 patients enrolled. And of the patients, uh, 31 patients had a PCR by biopsy and imaging and breast surgery was omitted. 19 patients had standard of care, so 38%. So now we've got 31 patients that we're moving forward on. Um, and uh, these patients, um, of those patients, um, the 12% of the patients who enrolled in the trial altogether had no positive disease, but most had no negative disease. Uh, more than 50% are HER2 positive, 42% triple negative. Why do we include that group? Because ER positive doesn't get very high path CR rates. That's why. So here's the ipsilateral breast tumor-free survival among patients who didn't have breast surgery at three years, 100% of patients. So nobody's had any uh, recurrence in breast at a median follow-up of 38 months. So that's a median of about three years. Uh, very interesting uh, data for this group of patients. They also looked at circulating tumor cells and circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and then they looked at C that two patients who were CTC positive at baseline, um, they then were two were positive at six months, one at 12 months. So they followed that along to try and see whether or not that would tell them about recurrence. Um, and CTDNA was uh, looked for to look for biomarkers of resistance. Um, and they only saw a little bit. So it wasn't really all that helpful, actually, because they didn't see a lot, thankfully, because these patients had fabulous responses. So, uh, you know, they couldn't really use the circulating blood markers because it was so limited. Um, and at with 50 patients, of which, you know, the percent I showed you earlier had PCRs, the results were very good. But it's important to keep in mind this represents 31 patients. Uh, and uh, HER2 positive disease with a pathologic complete response, you get a year of trastuzumab and pertuzumab if you're giving both. So they, those patients won't have been very far away from having their HER2 targeted therapy. So we need longer follow-up and obviously larger studies in order to put this into clinical practice. Uh, before I ask you guys about this, um, one of the questions that came up in the, let's see if I can get out of here, no, stop sharing, okay, is um, when we said key 67, did I mean the key 67, the first biopsy or after the surgery, and the study did not say, so you could have a high key 67 at the initial biopsy, which is what we used for eligibility generally, or at the time of surgery, either one. Um, so, uh, what did you think about that uh, no surgery study? I thought it's bold to think about no surgery, especially for node positive disease. Um, I mean, it's a really novel idea and I think an important question, but yeah, interested to see with more follow-up what happens, but that struck me that some patients with node positive disease would not get surgery. How about you, Laura? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, that piece of it makes me nervous. I, I do think it's not, I mean, it definitely is not ready for prime time, but will be interesting to follow out um, some of these patients, especially with very low risk disease. I think I get this question a lot clinically for patients that are on the much older side um, that just don't want surgery. And you know, we sometimes even give endocrine therapy before surgery and their tumor seems to shrink away. And they're like, well, do I need to go to surgery? And I think there are settings where potentially we could consider not in those cases. And that's some, that's an application where I think we might consider using data like this to help guide things. But um, right now, I don't think it's ready for prime time for most patients. When somebody asked in the Q&A, why no surgery? Why no surgery? Yeah. As you pointed out. Uh, some people don't want surgery. Some people don't want surgery. Many people don't want surgery. Um, I think fortunately, breast surgeries are often recoverable, but I think especially as people get older, it's you know, not something that everyone wants. So, and a corollary, Laura, why do we not do surgery in patients who have stage four disease? 
Good question. Um, so once the, the tumor has spread beyond the breast and axillary lymph nodes and it's in the whole body, we have data that actually doing surgery to remove the tumor in the breast or the lymph nodes doesn't help improve survival, basically because we know that the tumor is already elsewhere. Um, and that's the, the disease elsewhere is actually what ends up, you know, causing death for patients because the, the cancer in the breast is not the problem. It's the fact that it can spread to other organs and, and cause organ dysfunction. And so rather than doing surgery to remove it in the breast, which isn't going to help people live longer, we usually instead use systemic therapy, which targets the cancer that's everywhere, um, particularly the more problematic, um, you know, areas like the liver, the lungs, the brain, et cetera. Yeah, and now we can do radiation to target sort of problematic areas. There's a lot of interest in sometimes using radiation if you have a single metastatic site and everything is responding beautifully. Um, although we don't know that that improves outcome, we'd like to believe it does. And it's very hard, you know, it's individual patient versus a large population. And the studies that have been done have included like all different cancer subtypes. And, you know, there may be subtypes that benefit more than others. And uh, of course, the whole question that this person asked, if there's no surgery, want to keep on spreading? Uh, no, not for metastatic disease, because there are cells that we don't see. So if you remove the primary tumor, um, which the idea was that maybe that's where all the cancer came from, actually the cancer is sitting in lots of other places. So it just moves around. It doesn't actually help. And you have to stop therapy to do the surgery. And it's often quite disfiguring. And so the whole idea of doing a bunch of surgery that isn't going to help you to live longer is then that's really where that came up. Now, I will say that somebody who has HER2 positive metastatic disease who has, you know, basically all their cancer goes away for several years. Um, if there's a concern about something in the breast, that might be one situation where you might do a breast surgery, but generally we don't. And if you have a single liver lesion, now we can target it with radiation therapy as appropriate as a, a after a response to systemic therapy, because if you just target each one, the so-called berry picking or cherry picking both, um, then it just pops up next to it. It's like whack-a-mole, you know, it doesn't work. So, but, you know, we're learning lots of new things and following and trying to figure out how to further improve things and, you know, use radiation to stimulate immune system and help immunotherapy, many different areas. And we'll tell you more about breast cancer and the updates in early January when we review the San Antonio Breast Cancer uh, meeting. Hopefully both Laura and Saya will, will be there. Saya is going to have her first child in some time at the end of January. End so of January. <laughs> <laughs> so, and first babies are rarely early, so yeah. we'll see. Uh, but uh, excellent, excellent uh, presentations. Both of you so appreciate your time after a long day in clinic. And all of you, the participants in uh, for the, somebody's raising their hand, but uh, the participants of uh, the forum for your questions, for your participation, for your support, and of course, to Melody for without whom we wouldn't have the forum. So thank you so much, everybody. I look forward to talking to you in January. Happy end of your year, holidays, new year, et cetera, and be safe and well. Take care.